I see a lot of uh, on ramps for Bitcoin getting wired. You know, you've seen you've seen this the strengthening of Square and Coinbase and PayPal. You see Nidig doing really good work to wire up a lot of community banks and traditional institutions to Bitcoin. You're seeing the bigger banks, Goldman Sachs, you know, and Morgan Stanley and others getting involved. The Bitcoin derivatives market is growing. Companies like MicroStrategy or well, you could think of us as, you know, we're in essence, we've created a stock, which is a derivative, convertible bonds that are derivative, secured bonds that are derivative. The key is to create this channel between the ocean of conventional traditional assets and this this crypto pond, if you will, right? And then there's a channel that, that uh, is carved and a lot of people are doing really good work in order to carve that channel to, to normalize expectations and uh, it just takes time. So I, I think that as time goes by, there are just more and more ways uh, to buy Bitcoin and buy instruments and financial products that are backed by Bitcoin. All of those are going to create more demand for the underlying asset. And, uh, and as that demand builds up, then, you know, you would expect the price will continue to appreciate because the macroeconomics are very favorable, right? We know we're going to continue to, uh, to expand the money supply in dollars and euros and everywhere else in the world. The technology dynamics are very favorable. Uh, we keep improving lightning apps, Square, Cash app call it Bitcoin back. So all those things are rolling out. And as those things roll out uh, bit by bit, the entire asset class will just get more energy flowing into it. Right. And first we did a, you know, a quarter billion dollar purchase. Then we did a Dutch auction and our shareholders left us with 175 million more dollars. So I didn't know I'd have the 175 million dollars after the first 250 million. I didn't know that until 20 days after the Dutch auction was announced. So after we had that, we did the second purchase. Then the stock traded up. We ended up with a lot more money. The business was doing great. So we did a third purchase. Then we went to the bond market and we offered 400 million in convertible bonds. And the, I mean, the company stock was trading at the, at the high for 10 years, 300 bucks. And we did the bond offering and then it was upsized because there's a lot of demand. So then we did a $650 million purchase. And then Bitcoin marched up. I think we did that at 20,000 and Bitcoin went up and our stock went up, you know, and then pretty soon we were trading at like eight or eight times what we had been at uh, four months ago. So we were able to do another financing and we did a billion dollar purchase. Then after that, you know, we were able to do a $500 million debt offering at six and an eighth percent interest. When the dust settled, we had raised $2.2 billion in debt. And through the Dutch auction process, we had another 400 million in equity plus another 100 million. So we found a way we found like 2.8 or $2.9 billion. We didn't know we would have. And the debt was uh, was borrowed about 1.5% interest rate. So if I had if I had put out a press release in June saying I want to borrow $2.2 .2 billion for 1% interest to buy Bitcoin, that wouldn't have happened. Right. If I had gone to the board and said, that's what I want to do, they would have said, you're crazy. That's not going to happen. So we kind of worked our way into this um, because of a fortunate set of events, a lot of macroeconomic tailwinds blowing in our favor. And then every time we had an opportunity, we seized the opportunity. You know, so fortune favors the bold, right? Like a, the best surrogate for an investor is the monetary inflation rate and the monetary inflation rate is somewhere between the M2 money supply expansion and the S&P index. Take the S&P index, 38%, it's up, and then subtract 3% risk premium. And you could say there's a 35% risk-free hurdle rate. That was the rate at which the currency devalued, right? The dollar weakened by enough to drive the stock indexes up by 38% this year instead of 10% which is the average over a hundred years. So you 
you know, and it was when it was going up 10% a year, it was inflating at 7%. I think I think the money supply expands at 7%, you tack on a 3% risk premium, that gets you 10%. That's normal. And we're like triple normal, depending upon, you know, what your reference point is. And if you're taking monthly averages or quarterly averages or daily averages. I think inflation is a vector. And, and so it's not one number, it's not a scalar and you can't use arithmetic. Um, if you want, if you want to be simplistic, you say inflation is C, CPI or PCE and is one number and it, you, we were targeting 2% and now it's four or five. But I, that's not the way I think it is. I think it's an in-dimensional vector. So for example, I think the inflation rate in single family homes in the US is 25%. I think inflation rate in, in equity was 38%. The S&P 500 index is up 38%. The cost of buying a share of stock in a company is 38% higher. So if you look at asset inflation, Bitcoin's up 270%. NASDAQ is up 40 something percent. There's no inflation in gold. That's flat. Real estate's up 20 percent or more. You know, you can find a market basket of things called CPI that are only up 5 percent. And you can say that's transitory. It's irrelevant whether it's transitory or not. If I keep track of a list of things that you don't want to buy and I tell you that the price hasn't gone up, what does it matter whether the price went up or not? The question is, what do you want to buy and what prices are going up? And I think the price is going up at a different rate every month in every different place in the world and every different cohort for a thousand different product services and assets. And I, I think that uh, the, the Bitcoin network is uh, reorganizing, distributing. A lot of people that own Bitcoin in China had to sell it in a hurry. So they had to, they had to take a haircut in order to liquidate their Bitcoin and convert back into RMB. And that caused volatility in the market. I think that um, the Chinese exodus, it's a tragedy for the Bitcoin miners in China and Bitcoin holders in China, right? I feel awful for them. I think it's, uh, it's a, a mistake for China, the country, they're gonna lose a trillion dollars. They're giving up. They had half of the, the mining industry and in an industry that's growing 100% a year and they gave it up. Uh, I think that the result is the Bitcoin network will shift to the West. It's a benefit and a windfall for the rest of the world. It's good for Africa. It's good for South America. It's great for North America. It's an opportunity for progressive miners. Uh, it's an opportunity for progressive politicians and political jurisdictions. Texas wants the mining. Why, why wouldn't you want the mining? Uh, this Bitcoin mining is the highest, the highest uh, value and use of intermittent or stranded energy of any any industry in the world. You know, I as I said, that you know the, the best thing to do is if you're gonna if you're not gonna hold it for four years, don't buy it at all. Because if you're thinking shorter than four years, you're kind of more either a trader or a speculator. The best period is forever. And if you can't be forever, look out 10 years and then you won't have the anxiety. Make sure you get the staying power and don't get yourself in a situation where you might get forced liquidated on a 20 or 30 or 55 percent downdraft because the key is it's like you know if you could buy 50 blocks in manhattan 200 years ago there's no way you wouldn't have made money unless someone called your loan and liquidated you out and you had to sell it sometime in the last 200 years so you just want to have the staying power to stick around for the long term and let nature run its course <laughs>